Okay, hello. Welcome to the Nio Marsh Short Story Contest results. I am Louise Wacon, and in, on behalf of the Friends of Nio Marsh, I'd like to thank you for joining us on this, the 127th birthday of Nio Marsh. So, Dame Nio Marsh was one of New Zealand's leading crime writers. She was also an artist and a dramatist and she left behind an incredible legacy in the literary world but also as a patron of the arts and so today on her birthday we are celebrating that legacy with a short story contest that revolves around the first line of one of her novels so to get things started, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nio Marsh and what makes her so special. So basically, Nio Marsh was born in Findleton Christchurch in 1895. She spent most of her life in Christchurch and she lived for most of that time in the same house at 37 Valley Road. I mentioned that she is best known as a crime writer, and that is what she is best known as internationally. She wrote the first of 32 detective novels um, when she, well, in 1931. And um, yeah, kind of just continued from there, building this amazing legacy, along with Agatha Christie, Marjorie Allingham, and Dorothy L. Sayers, Nio Marsh was one of the four queens of crime that dominated what is known as the golden age of crime fiction, which sort of spanned the period between the two world wars. Um, she was just an incredible creative powerhouse. But um, writing was not her first love. In fact, she wanted to be an artist before um, getting kind of distracted by the stage. She was awarded an OBE in 1948 for services to New Zealand theatre. And I think this is what she is primarily known for in New Zealand, just her dedication to the theatre, in particular to Shakespeare, and her um, determination to sort of hand that sort of cultural tradition on to new generations of students. Um, my grandma, as an art student, painted sets for um, Dame Nayo's theatre productions, and she had a close relationship with the University of Canterbury um, for for many decades. So she um, she left just such an incredible legacy behind in many areas that we think it is important that that legacy is not forgotten. Which brings us to the Nio Marsh House. So this, her house is a Hurst Seeger house. He was a cousin of her mother's. It stands at 37 Valley Road in Kashmir here in Christchurch. And it is possible to visit it. This house is just an incredible treasure. Visiting it is kind of like reading a biography of Dame Nayo's Mar Marsh's life, but it's a biography that you can touch and sit in. The house still has just so many of her personal possessions, including her passport. And you can see where she inserted the words Dame before her name, um, which is probably not technically allowed, but who's going to argue with Naya Marsh? You can open the wardrobe and see her clothes still hanging on the, the hangers. The kitchen is like a stepping into a time machine. It's this beautiful, funky sort of 19, I think 1960s, 
era kitchen that um, so many people step into it and are like, wow, my mum had a kitchen exactly like this. And then the long room, which is my favourite room, where you can sit in the chair that Nayo sat in as she wrote her novels. This house is just an amazing cowpapa. And in order to preserve not just Nayo's legacy, but the physical legacy of her house, the Friends of Nayo Marsh were formed to fundraise to maintain the house take tours of the house and sort of um, share Nayo's legacy with those who visit it. So on that note, um, the contest that we're celebrating today was the brainchild of one of the friends of Nayo Marsh, Karen, who decided that it would be a lot of fun to organise a short story contest based around the first line of one of Nayo's novels. The novel that she chose was Death in Ecstasy, Ecstasy sorry, and the first line is, on a pouring wet Sunday night in December of last year, a special meeting was held at the House of the Sacred Flame in Notlatches Row. This line has just so many, so much potential. You could go so many ways with it. And so to kind of rein in some of that potential, make it a bit more of a challenge, Karen decided there should be a limit of 500 words. She recruited myself and Wendy, who you will meet in a moment, to join her as judges. And we had the privilege and pleasure of reading over I think around 30 entries and um, trying to decide which of many favorites was our most favorite favorite. It was a lot of fun, it was a lot of work, but um, ultimately it was just fa a fantastic experience and we are so thrilled to share with you the three finalists today. So in a moment, we're going to hear, meet two of our finalists and um, I'm going to interview them. Sadly, one of our three finalists can't join us today, um, but in his stead, we have Wendy who will read Bruce's work. So I'm just going to bring Wendy onto the stream with me. Hello, Wendy. <laughs> Hi, Louise. So um, we are just about to talk about Bruce Miller's entry. Bruce was our third finalist, and you are going to read his entry for us. I think this entry kind of really speaks to the incredible variety of all of the, the entries we got. We're going to see that when we get onto our other finalists' work. But um, yeah. What was what was your first impressions on reading this one? I had to read it twice. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've every time I read it, I just love it more, more and more. It's very clever. It's amazing what people can do in only five hundred words. I know, so. with a very very tricky first sentence. Exactly. So I'm going to share Bruce's bio and then I'm going to disappear and let Wendy um, thrill you with his entry. So apart from 10 years working overseas, Bruce Miller has spent most of his adult life in Wellington. He worked in a variety of management roles and began writing after his retirement. His sole publication to date is the first in a planned series of crime novels set in Wellington. Bruce is currently working on the second novel in the series. Right. Mallory's Rules by Bruce Miller. On a pouring wet Sunday night in December last year, a special meeting was held at the House of the Sacred Flame in Knocklatches Row. Mallory sat at the head of the table in the Great Hall flanked by Ram's bottom on his right and Blackstone on his left. In theory, they were equal, 
but Mallory presided over their quarterly meetings and had cause called this special meeting. Disputes between us over territories have got out of hand, he said. We have to sort this out right away. Ramsbottom protested. It is you who is doing the encroaching, Mallory. Mallory was surprised. This was a rare show of independence. Ramsbottom lacked confidence largely because of his looks. Pasty face, buck teeth and a large wart on his chin. Not so Blackstone. He also had a pasty face, but was debonair and confident. That's not helpful, Ramsbottom, he said. We need to forget about what's happened in the past and get agreement as to the future. But Mallory's got the great hall and the wine cellar and he still wants more, whined Ramsbottom. Mallory said, I've only got two areas and you have the ante room, the kitchen, the reception area, the coat room and the smoking room. That's five areas. But, but, Ramsbottom spluttered. The Great Hall is much bigger than all my areas put together. Mallory fixed him with a steely gaze. Let me remind you that I used to be a grandmaster here and you too were just ordinary masters. Rank does carry some privileges. Let me put my cards on the table, he continued. I want the smoking room and two of the bedrooms. You have all the fun up there, Blackstone. It's quite boring in the Great Hall. Blackstone acquiesced immediately. It was no use fighting against Mallory. Besides, he knew he had had a good run with the best territories. Seven bedrooms. What a time he'd had. And he could have almost the same enjoyment from five bedrooms. All right, then, everyone agreed, said Mallory as if Ramsbottom's opinion on the smoking room was of no consequence. Ramsbottom opened his mouth to speak, saw the set of Mallory's face and decided against it. Mallory always got what he wanted. They all stood up to go back to the secret chamber. Ramsbottom and Blackstone passed through the mirror at the end of the great hall but Mallory stopped to admire his portrait on the wall. The inscription read, Robert Mallory, Grand Master, 1858 to 1862. Thank you, Wendy. It's really satisfying getting to the end of that piece and then that little twist that kind of reveals, <laughs> hang on. This isn't what it seems to be. One of the things that I really enjoyed about all three of our finalist pieces were that they all had that that twist. Don't didn't yes. you enjoy that? I did. I did very much. It's fun to read. Very Thank fun. You. And you read it beautifully. So thanks very much, Wendy. So we're going to say goodbye to Wendy a moment. And we're going to welcome Darren. Hello, Darren. Hello, Louise. It is fantastic to have you with us today. And um, it's really exciting that you're going to um, read your piece. I think there's something very special when, about an author reading their work. So um, before we get to that, though, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Oh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a writer. Um, I just enjoy playing with words. Um, I write across a wide range of genre. Um, a very wide range fantasy, of genres. Um, and I, I even write a little bit of poetry now and then. So um, it keeps me busy. And I like to tell people it keeps me off the streets. Okay. And uh, <laughs> keeps my brain active too. That is Absolutely fantastic. Without any more ado, I'm going to disappear and let Darren share her piece. So it's over to you, Darren. Thank you. Here we go, and I just hope I don't stumble. 
On a pouring wet Sunday night in December of last year, a special meeting was held at the House of the Sacred Flame in Knocklatches Row. It is the year of our Lord, 2042. In 2032, the coalition government, led by the Greens, banned the importation of all tobacco products. Since then, the ability to light up has become a sacred right, an expression of freedom. A black market of homegrown tobacco thrives, but is insufficient to meet the demand. The prospect of languishing in jail for supplying tobacco has never appealed and growers are declining in number. The majority of the population thinks the House of the Sacred Flame is a branch of the Masonic Lodge, but smokers know better. Nicotine addicts across the Motu belong to the Sacred Flame, their sole means of acquiring their drug of choice. Order, Bill Spark commands, and the murmuring dies. Our predicament is dire. One of our members has given up smoking, and you all know there's nothing worse than a reformed smoker. He's threatening to go to the authorities with details of our dolphin delivery chain, unless we pay him to keep quiet. Murmurs of blackmail and disbelief arise and necessitates oh, another order being shouted. I'll hand over to Aaron Spratt, our social media expert. He has an idea. With a two-packet-a-day habit, Aaron is one of the youngest and most media-savvy members. Aaron stands, coughs <coughs> several times, then begins. I think we should preempt the leak. He pauses for effect. I suggest we write blog posts saying the rumour that cigarettes are being ferried to shore by trained dolphins is beyond crazy. Hopefully, when our ex-member tells Customs Department this, they will laugh and think it is the same silly rumour. We could suggest things like drone delivery under the cover of darkness, Mary Lou says, and Bill Spark winces as this is another of their covert transportation methods. Submarines, Kevin suggests, like in the war. Because it is war, isn't it? Our right to inhale pitted against government regulations. Homing pigeons, a packet tied to each leg, suggests Fetu O'Brien. Anything you can think of, crazier the better, Aaron agrees. Just like my posts and tag someone you know so it spreads on social media. Anybody tried smoking in public lately, Bill asks? Not stupid. Not bloody likely. And get arrested for possession, a voice at the back calls. Freedom of choice carries its penalties. In the following weeks, a constant stream of crazy suggestions appear on social media. Members of the Sacred Flame vie with each other for the best idea of the week, especially when the prize, decided by President Sparks, is a packet of cigarettes. When ball-balancing dolphins are seen offshore, people laugh and pictures appear in the national papers. But these floating balls are slowly eased shoreward. The years of training paying off. Tasty, fresh mackerel or kahawai keep the dolphins willing to transport the cigarettes from ship to shore. This month, the House of the Sacred Flame is holding a social evening with free cigarettes as prizes. Members only. Tickets have sold out. That's it. I'm muted. Thank you, Darren. That was really fantastic. And despite having read your entries many, many times, I still found myself smiling 
which I think is um, testament to the, the power of the humor you've included. So I've got a few questions to ask Darren, but for those of you who are watching us on Facebook, please feel free to add a question of your own in the chat. If we don't have time for it now, we may be able to squeeze it in at the end. So what I most want to know is how you got from the NIO's first line on a pouring wet Sunday night in December of last year, a special meeting was held at the House of the Sacred Flame in Knockbatch's Row to tobacco smuggling dolphins. Were there other ideas or did you just, did it just come to you? No, it, it was quite difficult. I, I usually don't have trouble with ideas, but I had to really drag this one out. Um, what triggered it was I concentrated on the sacred flame. And then there was an announcement um, that the government was hoping to ban cigarettes and tobacco altogether by some year in the future, 19, you know, 2035 or something. And I thought, well, you know, that, that of course, would make for a black market in cigarettes bound to just like the prohibition did with alcohol. So I thought I could use that, the house of the sacred flame as a cover, right? like a, a cover headquarters for illicit smoking. And it, yeah. the story grew from there. there were, now, I didn't have any other ideas. When I got that one, I thought that'll have to do, it took me long enough to get that one. There were other entrants who played with the idea of a sacred flame, but none of them ended up with dolphins. So that was very, very unique. Now, you have written in so many different genres and formats, including flash fiction. Do you think having that kind of variety of experience helped you when crafting your entry? Or do you think... Um, being um, knowing what it's like to write sort of longer form stuff made it harder for you to kind of whittle it down to a 500 words. Well, I, I've spent the last couple of years um, enjoying flash fiction and writing 500 word exercises. And I have found that it's been of great help to me when I write anything because you, you write your whole idea down and then you have to self edit. And you have to read it through again and again and have to get rid of every single word that isn't of any use. And sometimes um, it's quite painful, but it's a very good exercise. And as the time goes by, I'm, I'm feeling it, um, it's a little bit easier. Uh, but yes, I think, I think that writing the flash fiction has really helped me with this particular entry. Uh, but it, it was hard to start with, but I've sort of got my head around it now. I've, well, I hope I have anyway. Well, <laughs> Each one's a challenge. Every single one's a challenge. <laughs> given that you are a finalist in this contest, I would say it's working. So I really enjoyed, one of the other things I enjoyed about Desperate Times was just the tightness of the your writing in it. Is that another skill? Is that a skill you've developed? And if so, how? Well... Yes, it, I have developed it and it's it's got to the stage because I've been doing these flash fictions for the last couple of years, it's got to the stage now that as I'm typing it out, I can, I can automatically think I don't really need that sentence and I can delete it and I can, so I'm very prone to throw in a lot of comments that aren't necessary and I'm finding now that I, I can actually delete them quite painlessly, it doesn't hurt at all. Once upon a time, I used to save them in case I needed them again. But um, <laughs> now I realize I don't have to do that. Yeah, that is an awesome realization to have. And you've given me hope as somebody who still saves all of their deletions. So coming back to the element of humor in your entry, I have had a look at um, some of your other books. Um, in particular, you've got a crime novel with a detective struggling with agoraphobia that really looks like it's up my alley. But am I right in thinking that humour plays a big part in your work? Yes, it seems to. And to be perfectly honest, I've got no idea why or how. Um, 
I don't try to write funny. I, I just write, I, I'm a touch typist, so I'm very lucky. I can just type as the characters in my head are talking and doing things, or I think of ideas. And um, it, just, it just happens. I think the people in my head are funny, not me. I'm, you know, I'm sort of putting down their dialogue and that sort of thing. Uh, but I, I have tried to write horror on several occasions and I, I sent a horror piece to a girlfriend that I really was seriously awful and she sent it back ha 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 this is the funniest thing I've ever read so I gave up then I just thought well obviously I'm not meant to write horror and obviously you know humor just it it's sometimes it's not supposed to be there and it I sometimes I just have to delete it it just creeps in and I don't honestly know why or how it happens People think things are funny that I don't. So, you know, perhaps it's just the play of words or something. I don't know. Oh, however it comes about, I really enjoyed it, especially in your, your entry to this contest. And so for our final question is one that um, I'm sure you've had many times before, but what advice would you give to new writers? Well, other than the usual right, right, right. Goodness me, there's the phone. I hope my husband gets it. Um, I think you need to find somebody to read your work. Oh, please, God. Yes, he's picked it up. Um, <laughs> you need to find other writers to read your work, not mum and dad or your sisters or cousin Joe. You need to get other writers to read your work and get them to give you honest feedback and also, if you read other writers' work, you can easily pick up things in someone else's work and, and you can find suggestions to improve their work. And once you get into the swing of it and you get used to it, you, it's much easier then to be critical of your own work and to hone it down. But really, without critique partners or mentors or call them what you like, other, other writers helping me, I would never have got published and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. And so as a result, I do read quite a lot of other people's work and make suggestions. But I always say I'm not an editor. I don't know. I haven't got any qualifications on grammar or anything, but I can make some suggestions. And that's what new writers should do is just find critique partners, join some groups, romance writers, yeah. book clubs, um, just find people that like to write like you do and exchange work and you'll find it makes a big difference. I think that is really excellent advice. So thank you very much, Darren. It has been a pleasure talking to you and hearing your entry. Thank so, you for having me. So now we're going to go to our remaining finalist, Wayne. Hello. Hi, dear. It is great to have you with us tonight. Apologies for making you wait. Um, no behind the scenes technical difficulties. So Wayne and Darren have been amazingly patient throughout all of that. So I'm actually really excited to hear Wayne's entry. But before we get to that, Wayne, please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you, you and what you write. Oh, well. Um... Um, I live in Auckland. Um, I, I'm, I'm mostly a screen writer. I write for television and film. I've written for Shortland Street in the past and um, uh, some shows on Māori television. So normally that is what I write, um, uh, screenplays and scripts. So this was uh, quite, quite something different for me to try. Yeah. I'm really curious about how it was going from screenwriting to what is basically sort of flash fiction. But before we get there, we are going to hear your entry, okay. um, Magic Happens. So yeah, I'm great. going to disappear so we can enjoy your piece. Great. I'm actually going to have a read by my brother-in-law and then I'll come back and then we'll talk about it. Hello there. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah. 
You sound okay. great. Magic Happens by Wayne Hortu. On a pouring wet Sunday night in December of last year, a special meeting was held at the House of the Sacred Flame in Knock Latches Row. A coven of stage magicians gathered to compete for a platter of sterling silver coins once owned by the coin slight wizard, the King of Coins. The silver coins were rumoured to be worth up to £25,000. First up was Billy Blaze, the cowboy magician, who smoked a small cigarette as he shuffled a clean deck of cards. He threw his deck up in the air, quickly drew his revolver and shot at the deck. The cards exploded into confetti, giving everyone a fright. The cowboy holstered his revolver with a lopsided smile, asked the crowd if they'd be so kind as to check up each of their sleeves. Four audience members stepped forward, astonished to find aces up their sleeves, each with a bullet hole through. The cowboy magician tipped his hat at the gathering. Next was a beautiful enchantress of the East, who set a small golden clockwork songbird on the podium. She gently caressed the clockwork's head and a mechanical trill sounded. Within moments, live songbirds of every color and melody appeared from behind the podium to join in the chorus. The enchantress stroked the back of the clockwork again, and as the trill died, each of the songbirds disappeared again. She bowed in respect to her competitors. Jason Domino, a doyen of the British theatre, brought a full-length mirror on stage. He had his pretty assistant walk behind it, and as she disappeared behind the mirror, the image of a large, burly sailor appeared walking across the mirror until the pretty assistant reappeared on the other side. Jason himself then walked behind the mirror. The image of Jason Domino dressed as a pantomime dame appeared in the mirror to the raucous laughter of all. She gave a curtsy and a heave of a generous bosom before disappearing and the sharp suited illusionist appeared once again from the other side of the mirror. Jason Domino and his assistant bowed. The final contestant was a surprisingly young Maestro Ladro, wearing an old-fashioned top, hat, and tuxedo. He expressed his apologies that his trick would be a simple and inelegant affair, as opposed to the previous entries, but he hoped it would be appreciated in the spirit it was given. He had with him a traveller's trunk. My brother is a theoretical physicist, and many nights he speaks to me about the possibilities of other dimensions and other worlds. Tonight, I intend to travel to another realm and hopefully ignite your imaginations. If someone would please help me with these. Maestro Ladro proffered his hands with a pair of handcuffs. Once secured, he opened the trunk, stepped inside and closed the lid above him. After an inordinate amount of time, one of the magicians finally opened the trunk to find the final contestant had vanished, never to be seen again, along with the platter of sterling silver coins. I think I enjoy that piece more every time I hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne's brother-in-law. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so magic happens, flows so naturally that it's hard to imagine anything else following the opening line. How did you get the idea of turning um, Nayo's first line into a magic contest? Well, I thought the um, the prompt itself was very rich, and um, just the idea of a house of sacred flame kind of um, brought me to mind of a like a group of women coming together, 
and that kind of um, turned into magician, then into a magic content. Um, so yeah, um, the the inspiration for the um, yeah, so it's mainly just um, magicians coming up with um, um, with different tricks to try and top each other. So yeah, it was basically came from the prompt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it just it works together so love so nicely. One element in your piece that I really enjoyed was that twist at the end. Um, it just flowed. It was just flowing, flowing, flowing. Hang on. <laughs> and I'm wondering um, if perhaps that is a a skill you've developed through screenwriting, where um, you've kind of you've got to to surprise people and keep them watching. Would you agree, or do you think yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, in, in terms of this story, it was more, um, I had the inspiration, the, the very last line came first. Oh, so that's from there, Yeah, so from there, I worked my way back. Yeah. Um, and with screenwriting, uh, we're often given um, prompts uh, as to what it needs to happen in the screen, um, on screen. So we, uh, we also work with um, a similar in a similar uh, form where we told what should happen and how we have to build on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's just fascinating. Um, so you're, you're usually writing um, scripts, I imagine. Is this the first time you've been sort of constrained to such a small format? What challenges did you find keeping your piece to 500 words? Well, it was almost the opposite for me because um, with, in writing our script, quite often the, um, uh, the word limit, the word range uh, they want is quite significant, um, up to um, maybe even 50,000 words. So um, sometimes it's a bit of a struggle trying to fill fill in that gap. So having such a small, contained, um, perfectly formed um, story, actually I found worked better uh, for me. Yeah. It's, again, that's not at all what I expected. Thank you. And... Yeah. Let's see, much like the sleight of hand employ, employed by the contestants in Magic Happens, your narrative is really slick and smooth, painting kind of the, the vision that, the, that you want the reader to see. And I'm wondering, is this sort of typical of your narrative or is this a stylistic choice that you made for this piece? Um, I, I think it was both. I mean, sometimes when I write, I do tend to... Um, overly described, but in terms of this story, uh, I think it was a choice that I made it well. It was more look over here, look how, look at everything that's happening over here, and to misdirect you from um, what was happening over here. So it was kind of it was a choice to um, uh, to entertain and um, show the flash of the uh, magician um, competing to try and um, make you forget what the context was really about. Yeah. yeah. I love that because misdirection is a tactic used a lot in the golden era crime fiction. So you see it a lot in Agatha Christie's novels and also Naya Marsh's novels. So it's very fitting wow. that it's showing up in this yeah. context. So my final question for you is, um, what is the worst advice you've heard given to writers and what advice would you give instead? Oh, well, I don't know about the worst advice, but um, one piece of advice that I often hear quite often is um, when people say, write what you know. And I think the... I think the... Um, the idea behind that is to 
um, to get people to write authentically, uh, to be authentic about what they write. Um, but for me, I did that at the start of the journey. Um, because if you've got a, um, an imagination that just um, likes to roam around, um, then writing what you know um, is a, almost an invitation to research, find out different things, find out what interests you. But once you get a good um, layout of what um, you want to write about, then you can actually write more authentically about what, what it is that you um, want to write. Um, in terms of what advice I would give, um, I'm going to have to agree with what Darren said before. Uh, find other writers. Um, I myself, um, I'm in a writing group. Um, it's run by Catherine Burnett, who is a... Oh, she's great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's a screen writer and writing teacher. And so she's got a little group that gets together. And having other writers um, helps get... Um, help them um, expose you to what other people are thinking um, in terms of your own writing um, because you can get a little too stuck inside your head yeah um, and it's good to kind of have someone else to kind of bounce ideas off and to um, you know perhaps guide you another way yeah i absolutely agree with that i think you and darren are right on the nail there now we get to the most exciting part of the stream which is when i get to announce the results so let's see if i can make this happen okay so i'm going to announce um, the results in the order of third place second place first so um here we go now Third place winner goes to Bruce Miller with Mallory's Rules. Bruce, even though you're not here, congratulations. Yes, your piece was just so much fun, so unexpected. And yeah, we all really enjoyed it. Second place goes to Darren. Well done, Darren. Desperate Times was not just a really funny, interesting, unique piece, but you managed to get some social commentary in there as well. So, um, which is a heck of a lot for 500 words. So again, just well done. And well done. there's absolutely <laughs> no suspense left here. <laughs> but first place goes to Wayne. Well done. Oh, well done, Wayne, that's lovely. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so it has been um, an absolute pleasure to have you here. Yay! <laughs> That's fantastic. Wayne, you've got your supporters there with you. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so on the Facebook feed, we've got Yvonne and Fiona expressing that they are very, very proud of you, as they should be. So thank you again, Darren and Wayne, for being able to join us in person today. We really appreciate it. This event would not have been the same without you here. You really made it. So thank you thank you for your wonderful entries and yeah this is the first time that we're running this contest but it won't be the last so hopefully no pressure but it will be awesome to have entries from you when we open the contest again this year um, thank you very much for the opportunity it's been lots of fun i am so pleased to hear that so i'm going to say goodbye to darren Bye. and wayne now And I'm going to bring back Wendy. Is that okay, Wendy? Yes, okay, phew. So Wendy is here because we need to say thank you to the Friends of Naya Marsh and in particular Karen for kind of masterminding this whole thing. 
but also because there was um, there was some Dame Nio Marsh news today that I don't get the press. I haven't seen it, so I think Wendy should tell us about it. Well, when you opened the press, um, the weekend had Nio Marsh centre stage in the um, in the in the um, on the cover on the cover and I don't know who I think it was David I don't I can't remember the author but he was um, looking at going to uh, Rotorua as if you were a crime writer or as, as if Nio Marsh was walking into going to Rotorua choosing um, a nice hotel and choosing what places to go to visit or to have um, breakfast um, it was very very funny and a really good take off the now what's the the, the uh, book that she had that was set in oh I sh the mud pools I know the exact one you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. There's something colours in the colour scheme. Colour scheme. That's the one. That's yep. the one. Yeah. So if um, Bruce, Wayne and Darren's entries have sort of um, made you want a little bit more sort of light fiction or um, Naya Marsh inspired fiction, you should check out that article on the press. If you are in Christchurch and want to visit the um, Nio Marsh House, head over to nyomarsh.org.nz where you can um, book a tour. And is there anything else? Can I add, can I add something? Um, Absolutely. The house is wonderful and, and we love the house. We love all, everything that's in it. But the garden is great. And so Thank many you. of the friends, we 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 come together on a Tuesday morning, and we garden, and we cut back, we prune, and it's a heritage garden. So there's about seven of us come, and uh, yeah, we have lots really, of fun. It's a really nice group. Um, and after after some good work gardening, um, I think it's usually followed by a trip to a cafe, isn't it? No, so no, no. We start at the cafe. <laughs> we start at the we cafe. start at the cafe. Yes, that's we. Yep. And we sort of have like a, an impromptu meeting at the beginning, and it's yes. So we are we might be friends of the Nile Marsh, but we're all friends as well. Oh, thank you very much. So if you are in Christchurch and free on Tuesday mornings, um, this could be your new Tuesday morning activity. Yes, bring, bring all your tools and a bucket and, um, and your, yeah, your tools. And your love for crime fiction. Yes. I, I can tell you one other thing too. Yeah. I've got this book here from the library yeah and it's Nio Marsh the yeah. work the woman and the work and that is wonderful I've been reading that it's written by all sorts of um, people people from um, America from uh, England from New Zealand as well but you it's it's just magic. Absolutely just magic. You will love her. Awesome. Yeah. Well, if you uh, if this event has piqued your interest in Nio Marsh, definitely check out this really interesting looking book. Thank you for the recommendation. What's your favorite? Louise, what is your favorite Nio Marsh? I have quite a few. Um I really like, but I think it's the my recommendation if you want to read a Nio Marsh novel is to go for any of the ones with a theatre setting. Light Thickings is my absolute favourite. 
but she breaks all of the rules there. She kind of deviates from the kind of format of a yes. detective novel. So that one is more like it's one for the fans. But um, Death at the Dolphin, um, yeah, maybe Death at the Dolphin. Opening night. Opening, Opening night. night. Also, yeah. it's not theatre related, but Overture to Death just cracks me up. Um, yes. Yes, um, it's absolutely brilliant. And Scales of I Justice, love, purely for yes. the fish. I love um, Artisan Crime yes. because I yes. think Troy is a bit like Nio and you get to understand, understand. yeah, you get to understand her ideas of, of painting and how she looks at things. Mm, it's lovely. Yeah. The congratulations are still coming in for Wayne, which is awesome to see. <laughs> so I'm just going to wrap the stream up so we can let our finalists um, go and celebrate. But thanks again um, to Wayne, to Darren and Bruce for their incredible entries to all of our entrants. Um, honestly, it was so hard to just whittle it down to the final three. We had so much talent, so much variety. It was just really, really um, inspiring, actually, to see how many different pieces originated from that one short sentence. And um, big thanks to Karen for organizing this and for kind of corralling me and Wendy and making this happen. <laughs> And um, for the Friends of Nyamash, for all of their work behind the scenes, maintaining the Nyamash house and gardens. And lastly, to Nyo herself for um, her incredible career, incredible life and legacy. And yeah. yeah. I'd like to say um, also the members of the trust, they do so much work for the Nyamash house. And the trustees. I knew, uh, I knew I was going to more than, I am embarrassed yes. at the trust. <laughs> but yeah, we wouldn't be anywhere without the trust. So thank you. And without any further ado, thanks again for everyone who has joined us tonight. We've really enjoyed um, having you. And we hope that um, you've enjoyed this event and are inspired to either enter the contest this year or check out Nio Marsh and learn a bit more about her and her work. So until next time, farewell.